Hello, I'm Rob Herschel, CEO and co-founder of RackN, and this is an edgelab.digital training tutorial. We're gonna take you through the entire process to build an edge lab all the way through Kubernetes. If you wanna just jump to the cake and see the Kubernetes install, we have videos that start there. Now we're gonna go through and actually do our K3S cluster install. I'm gonna minimize this window and um, start the process. And it's it's really simple. We've already got uh, K3S in, available as a workflow ba based on our Edge Lab components. So this is our K3S install pieces. If I click on here, you'll see that it actually runs through a system where we install Kubernetes, we install the dashboard, and we install Helm. Uh, it's gonna go through this process incredibly quickly, including uh, actually putting all three of these machines into a cluster. Uh, so I'm going to start that process and then I have some slides that will actually help sort of explain what you're seeing because it happens so quickly. I've selected the machines I want in the cluster, in this case all of them, I could just have one. Uh, I'm going to pick the K3S cluster workflow. When I start that workflow I just have to add it to the machines, so it assigns it over here, and then it starts the process of going through the system. Uh, what it's already done here is it has assigned them into a cluster, elected one of the machines to be the leader of that cluster and then it is identifying um, the process for installing K3S. So uh, over here, if we click down in here, you will see a live, uh, this is a normal digital rebar feature. You actually can watch the, the tasks working and the different components being installed and operated. Uh, so here is, um, it's actually installed the NFS and it mounted that NFS uh, share that I had, had built in the cluster. Um, it's attaching the uh, local storage. Uh, in this case now, it's actually going through and um, downloading uh, K3S. Now, one of the things that we do in the system, you can see in this case, 102 was selected to be the leaders. The other ones are waiting. Um, we actually download and store the files. So uh, all of the systems don't have to install all the pieces. In this case, K3S is actually installed and cached as a local component. Um, and that means that when we do subsequent installs, we won't have to download. It'll just use the locally cached version. Or if you want to pre-populate, if you install the file in that location, it won't go to the internet. It'll just start running, running the system here. Um, if I jump on this profile, what you're, you'll see is this is the cluster profile. So all three machines are sharing information about the cluster that they're building in this location. The leader is actually populating information. It's just done this. Um, as it goes. So it's K3S node token, it's, config all, it's configuration file, all of those are um, populated here. What um, is interesting from that perspective is the other machines were waiting for that node token. Then they, once they saw it, they could complete their install and, and go through. In this case, they've already finished. Uh, the, the leader of the cluster has additional work. So in this case, the workflow is set to install dashboard and then run through a list of Helm charts if they're available. Um, and that means that we will have the Kubernetes dashboard available uh, and it's going through a standard process to make all that happen. It's super nice to be able to have the dashboard as a, as a thing. And um, the page I was just on, so the jobs log, so everything that happens in the cluster um, from an automation infrastructure's code perspective is uh, captured in these components and you can actually go back and see what they are. Uh, and you'll notice we actually track times. So if I go into a stage here, I can see exactly what was going on. So if I look at K3S install over here, I can actually see the time frames that it took to get different, different components to it going. Let me show you what that looks like and then we'll, we'll test our cluster. So what, we've, what I've just shown you from the K3S install perspective is that we've gone through this netboot and discovery. You watch me register the machines. When I started the workflow here, what I've done is uh, the nodes came in, elected a leader. Uh, one of them was fastest um, by whatever milliseconds and won the election. It began the download process. All of the other systems uh, stopped and watched for the credentials to surface. It pulled down K3S and built the K3S cluster, uploaded the credentials, and once those credentials were available, it joined K3S. Um, this isn't specialized functionality. This is completely out of the box capabilities for digital rebar in multiple senses. Um, and this type of cluster pattern is used all over um, 
in the, the way digital rebar works and, and has different infrastructures. Super handy to be able to build uh, Kubernetes that quickly. Um, and then the shared data store for the cluster allows us to do something very important. So if I come back over here and I can show you, here's my dashboard token, here's uh, different capabilities for it. Um, I can, and I'm gonna prepare to do this with command line. I'm gonna go to downloads because that's where my kube Cuddle is going to be, and I'm going to remove my any previous kube config. Over here, I can take my uh, Kubernetes uh, config file. Uh, this is the kube config. It's encrypted right now. If I download it, I can't download it. It's actually not the data. If I click on here, this is it's actually downloading and decrypting that that uh, file or it's sensitive data, so we store it in an encrypted way can hide that so it's not visible anymore. Now when I download it though, it's actually downloading that kubeconfig file. So if I cat kubeconfig, there is my JSON kubeconfig file for this cluster. That's, that's super handy. And if I do a kubectl uh, get nodes, there is my cluster that looks great. And I can even uh, get uh, the pods for our namespace uh, Kubernetes dashboard. Super handy. So you can actually see it has um, downloaded, installed Kubernetes dashboards already going. So if I do a kubectl and set up my proxy, in this case, now I've, I've um, got things running for that. I can come over and in my dashboard edge token, here's the IP, there's the uh, login I need for my proxy. Looks great. Now it's asking me for my token. One of the things that we, we've done in this case, I don't need both. One of the things we've done here, if I go back, you'll notice the dashboard token, uh, which was generated, also stored. I can cut that, bring it over to here, and log in with my token. And boom, I am now uh, running the Kubernetes dashboard. Everything was done for me. Right, there's a ton of steps and processes and things like that. You can look at the infrastructure's code components behind the scenes here, provision content, Edge Lab, and go in and look at exactly how these bits and pieces work. So this is all of the components that are necessary to install it. If you want to see how we install the dashboard, um, that code is exactly here and has all the pieces, parts, documentation that we that you could need to figure that out. Um, the other thing it does is it uses parameters. And so that's how we know that some of this data is secure or can be downloadable or should have clipboard access. Um, the parameters actually define what those components are. And so I can go back and look at what that looks like uh, in parameters. So here is our dashboard token somewhere. And you'll see that there's actually data that, that describes that it's secure, what type of data it is, some documentation for it. All those things are included in the infrastructure as code system uh, that allows digital rebar to do this. Uh, super, super straightforward. And once I have all this data, I can actually do really interesting things with it. For example, uh, if I'd wanted to install OpenFast, which um, is, is available as a pre-wired um, profile using Helm, I actually can apply this Helm open profile this Helm profile. So if I add that into the system, this is actually a uh, parameter that's defined. Uh, we could have multiple charts. This is a list of just one for OpenFAS. And it has um, instructions for kubectl that have to be done before and afterwards, like to collect the password, the repos, of where to get things, additional settings, and sleep. So we've taken a lot of these pieces that you normally need to do in Helm charts that make Helm charts not the only thing you have to do wired them into a process that's item potent. And so I can, I only have to really do this on the leader, come in and rerun the K3S install process. Uh, I actually need to clear it and then rerun it. So it recognizes that it was set or restarted. And it's going through the whole process. It recognizes that components have been done and it'll just skip over those processes and move into that Helm chart. And so once I've gotten to that point, I will be able to see uh, those installs kicking in. So if I come back over to the dashboard, I should start seeing, probably hasn't made it yet, 
there it goes. Helm Charts is now running that process. I can actually see it going through. It tells me it's running open OpenFAS uh, parts and making things go. And so if I check here, you'll see the dashboard already now reflects that OpenFAS is being installed and those containers are, are coming up to speed. Um, literally that easy to drop in and make everything go. And there's more. Uh, this is all sort of nice, but if I made a mistake or I'm testing something or I'm not happy with the results, I might want to actually just reset the cluster and start everything over. And because we're doing this in memory boot, it can be very, very simple to do that. I can literally delete my cluster, now no longer exists. Uh, I do want, I'm going to go ahead and just reboot those three nodes. They're no longer in the system, so I have to reboot them to allow them to be rediscovered. This cluster profile now has bad data in it, so I'm going to remove that. Looks, looks good. And now I can go back through and wait for the systems to boot. What I haven't shown you yet is what that, that boot process looks like. So this is what the uh, Pixie boot process looks like. It takes about 90 seconds uh, to bring the system fully up. I'm going to fast forward a little bit. Standard uh, Raspberry Pi sort of test screen. And then here is the boot going on. Uh, this is exactly what's happening in the background on my system as those three uh, Pies go through the sledgehammer boot. And you'll see I'm moving forward a little bit. Uh, that's 90 seconds in and I'm at the login screen for the system. Uh, and now I'm just waiting for the machines to come back. And you'll notice uh, I can check on the events. Everything uh, in Digital Rebar is a RESTful API, and there's a web socket that exposes uh, system events that you can subscribe to with filters and decide what you want to see or not. The leases coming through indicate the Pixie Boot process is going through and um, making progress along the lines here. And, and you can see I've started creating the machines. If I refresh here, you'll see my, my new uh, computers coming in, and they're waiting and going through the discovery process. Uh, one of my three pies is a little bit slower than the others, and I'm going to go ahead and not wait. I'm just going to start the K3S, K3 install process. Once again, it's going through electing leaders and doing all the things that you would expect it to do as part of this process. Um, here's my third, my other machine. And since it's going to show up, not be the leader, and just wait, I can start that at any point um, as soon as it's uh, ready to go. So now that machine will come into the cluster when it's ready. Um, and what I've just shown you is that inside of a two-minute reboot cycle, I can have a completely new Kubernetes cluster ready to go uh, and tested. And so that type of reset time um, is really important when you start going through iterative development and test and things like that, and a hallmark of the type of uh, lab environment that we're, we're working to build with Edge Lab. So I've shown you quite a bit of capability. We started from... Um, raw machines with SD cards, and we've walked you through in very, very short order through a complete infrastructure build, um, really a desktop data center where we have digital rebar installed from nothing, pulled down all the components, and then uh, got Kubernetes built completely from scratch also. So I hope this video was helpful. Please, please check out edgelab.digital. Um, this is open source uh, content, and we're looking forward to people going through extending and expanding the Kubernetes install or capabilities or bringing new installs to uh, the Edge Lab environment and making them available. Um, you know, it's designed as a reference architecture, and we're hoping that you help us make it an even better one. Thank you. Pretty fast, we're going to move through it. Um, what you want to do is start at edgelab.digital. Make sure you build. Uh, the pieces from the build of materials. Uh, in this case, I'm recommending the power over Ethernet switch, but you can power this with USB. We have bombs for both, build materials for both. Just order the parts, get them ready. It takes a little bit of time to get in, and you will end up with a Edge Lab that looks something like this. Let me show you a little bit closer view. And so what we have here is four Raspberry Pis stacked together in a nice set. Uh, it's hard to see in here, but the power over Ethernet, I actually have a very simple power over Ethernet adapter. And one of the things I've done is I've identified uh, with a little insignia and also labeling which one is the zero digital rebar server and then the other ones are all set to go uh, in this in this case. And all these instructions are in uh, this edgelab.digital site. I actually have a, a PowerPoint presentation that will help you sort of walk through that 
uh, Steam a little bit. And the first thing I'm going to do for this install is I'm going to take my SD card, it looks very nice and small, and I'm going to identify my Pi Zero. I'm going to install it here. You'll notice I actually have SD cards on all of the machines. These are for the clients that do Pixie booting, and then we leave them in because they provide storage for the cluster. Uh, so I'm going to go in here and I'm going to plug in my Pi cluster over here and let that start booting. Now that we've got uh, the cluster booting, I want to pull away from the edgelab.digital site itself and show you uh, some more detail on what we're talking about. This is the basic architecture for edgelab.digital uh, with these four Raspberry Pis, Pi Zero being the gateway and attached to Wi-Fi. In my setup, I've done something a little bit different, uh, highly recommended. I'm using the extra port on my uh, power of Ethernet switch as a hardwire connection to a second interface on my desktop. Uh, I've set that statically to 10.3.14.2 and that will allow me to ping, test, and, and SSH without needing a keyboard, monitor, keyboard or a monitor to actually attach to these RPIs. And that makes it super fast to do resets. I never have to worry about uh, watching myself type um, via uh, USB keyboard or something like that. Um, and I highly recommend that setup. It's, it's generally a good idea. And so from, from this perspective, what I can do here is if I ping 10.3.14.1, what you'll see, uh, my cluster's already up. In this case, I'm able to ping it back. If you're waiting for the cluster to be up, I would recommend just setting a 10 interval and waiting for the, the pings to come back. I have a video of that process that you could, uh, basically shows you what that looks like. And it's important because this will show you what the time frame is. That first SD card boot is going to take several minutes to come up before you get any uh, HDMI output signal at all. That's perfectly normal, so prepare for that. Uh, and then once it actually starts booting, you'll see that it's going to come back. Pings will start at this point. We have an OS running. Uh, it's going through a normal install process. Um, what you'll see is that then it pauses. Uh, we still can't log in. We're going to have to wait until the system gets into a full command line before we can log into it. Once it's reached that point, uh, then we can just go through and do a normal SSH uh, process. That takes a little bit of time, and it is super convenient to be able to um, not have to do it with a terminal. Uh, and that brings us into this process. So I've already showed you um, the first step where we built the cluster. We've installed our SD cards and flashed them. Um, and in that, in that case, we use a, I use a tool called Belina Etcher super handy um, just walk through and install it remember you need just one server card in this case this is what that looks like where I get to select an image off of my uh, system and then burn the card I don't have one one queued up um, but then I would pick my device and then let it go ahead and flash that takes a little bit of time also so you can run that in parallel as you're waiting um, I've just powered on the Raspberry Pis we're waiting for them and uh, I now have SSH available. So now I can log in and go ahead and do that and get, and get running. Um, and so once I'm ready for that, then I'm ready to go through our install process. So we've been waiting for the Raspberry Pi uh, to finish booting. In this case, you can see my pings are starting to return. That doesn't necessarily mean that SSH is, is ready. Uh, let, we can try though. SSH root at uh, 10.3.14.1. Uh, looks like I'm actually ready to log in. I do this all the time, so of course I'm gonna have a, a key failure because we're generating a whole new system. It's good. Now I can log in. Uh, yes, this is a new host. The password, uh, I have it here is Rocket Skates. Let me actually lift it off of this. So now I'm logged in to that system. Uh, pretty straightforward. And if I do a ls here, you'll see that um, we just have that one script for start me. If I check back in on my instructions over here, we are now on the next one down, which means that we're logging in with our Wi-Fi and password. What this does, if you remember here, is we turn the first, the Pi Zero, into our gateway, and it provides the internet access for all the other machines in the cluster. Um, that allows us to have a very 
uh, cluster-like experience from that perspective, and it also lets us you know, take advantage of the fast networking that we have in the system. Digital Rebar will actually cache a lot of assets so that you don't have to download each machine. Um, it has its own, own pieces, and that's good. Uh, what we will do here is we're going to say, um, we're going to do the start me script, uh, and I'm going to provide, and it'll get blanked out in the final cut, my uh, home Wi-Fi. Now, I, if I was using, and I could use my guest Wi-Fi in this case, the problem here is that when I do that, I don't have access from my network back to that IP address. And so I'm using my internal network. That suggests you do the same thing. Uh, you need to have a Wi-Fi that, uh, that has internet connection. Um, and it's going to go through and download and pull all of the pieces and parts. There's no additional steps necessary to do it. In this case, I don't use my Wi-Fi address um, as the primary address. And so uh, I will use the 10.3.14. I'm going to show you both ways to log into the system. Uh, and this step obviously will vary depending on your internet bandwidth. This is downloading digital rebar, uh, comp the binary components and the pieces that you need to get stuff running. And once it completes that process, it'll look up uh, the latest components in the catalog and pull those down to complete the install. A pretty straightforward process for this usually takes uh, just a couple of seconds. While we wait on that, that will queue us up for our next stage in this process while we're waiting for digital rebar to start. One of the things that's handy uh, that you want to get ready is your SSH key. The system now is continued uh, in the background and it's starting digital rebar as a service. This is uh, targeted for the digital uh, rebar 3.4 release and later. Um, we've been continually making improvements, and Edge Lab will always pull in the tip, the very latest code that we have available, um, so that you have access to the, the current. Uh, and the Edge Lab Digital Rebar is Digital Rebar. There is no specialized uh, version or anything like that. This is exactly the same stuff. So you could actually use this setup to boot any Pixie bootable systems. Um, Linux, ARM, AMD, Windows, ESX, it really doesn't matter. Um, you can go into the catalog, download extra components, and, and make things go. It is an ARM system, so uh, there are some caveats for uh, ARM versus AMD slash Intel uh, architectures. And that's it. We, we are now actually uh, ready to log into the system and make things go. If I open this link over here, then what you'll see is I have to accept the certificate. Uh, we use a self-signed certificate, all of our APIs that we can make secure or secure. Pixie is not actually a secure protocol. Once again, Rocket Skates uh, is our password for, for here. I already have it plumbed in, and we're going to be getting our terms of use. So I'm just logging through the system. You notice I'm, I'm using my Wi-Fi address. I could easily do the same thing. Go to HTTPS 10 10.3.14. Uh, one 8092 digital rebar port and go through the exact same process. Um, once again, different IP address, so a different TLS uh, certificate to accept, but I've already accepted the, TL the uh, use of the license, so I'm straight into the system. Uh, in either case, it's exactly the same. It's using our online UX, uh, which is React. All the communications, all the interface are actually happening on your network. Uh, Rackn does not reach into control or modify or touch or, or do anything with the system. It is completely self-contained in your network and uh, air gappable. Um, now, this does require internet inbound internet access because you have to download uh, the Kubernetes and other install components. We don't prepackage all of that into the system. You can preload them, that's more advanced. Uh, in this case, we're just pulling things through. While I'm talking to you, the system's actually going through its bootstrap process for us. So those couple of commands that, had that uh, the system had suggested we run, uh, bootstrapping process actually does that for us. It downloads the um, Pixie boot ISO for the other machines. It uh, sets up our subnets and other components like that. And so um, it's looking really good from that perspective. We can also go through, if we want, and check out the catalog and what's uh, been installed in the system. So this catalog goes to RackN's uh, catalog of all components. Uh, and you can go through and shop for different things. We've only looked at a couple of the pieces that are available. Uh, in this case, Digital Rebar, the community content, which is our, our operating system installs and base, base capabilities, Edge Lab, and then the task library, which has uh, advanced clustering, inventory, and some other, other components that Edge Lab depends on. 
as a, as a base. Uh, and in this case, NFS is actually going through uh, and getting installed, uh, and it's downloading, installing the uh, NFS components, um, and setting up an NFS share on the digital rebar server itself. So where are we in the system at this? Oh, I have to install my SSH key, which is super important, super handy at least. Um, you can do that from Info and Preferences. Info and Preferences is basically showing us all the components in the system here, uh, version, endpoint ID, feature flags that have been enabled. If I go to Add Key, I can bring in my SSH public key, install it. And when I do that, the nice thing is it will automatically install that key along with the Pi Zero's key on all of the systems. So I now can SSH into any Pixie, any system that Pixie boots as part of its default workflow. And uh, if you look at this, we've now completed the bootstrapping process uh, for the system. So all of the steps that are necessary to make this our work bootstrapping process um, is complete. Completed. Now it's time for us to power on our Raspberry Pis, um, which in this case I can do just by powering them on, plugging them into my ethernet. You can hear me clicking them in on the background. The first time you do this with uh, fresh out of the box uh, Raspberry Pis will take a few minutes because the SD card client that we have has to patch and set the BIOS. So it'll patch them to run uh, in ARM64 mode and Pixie boot. Uh, that's why those client cards are important. If you leave them in, they then become the storage for the Raspberry Pi cluster. Um, or you can um, just have one flash all your BIOS and then set up blank cards. You must have storage for the K3S cluster to work, uh, either a USB card in each machine or the SD card. Uh, it depends on how you prefer to, to make it work. So let's jump back over to Digital Rebar and see what's going on in this case. One of the things that we can do with Digital Rebar is turn on, ah, it's all over me. Um, we can turn on these event uh, systems and watch the DHCP system. So one of the things bootstrapping did is actually built the uh, subnet range necessary to DHCP in this cluster. One of the nice things about the way we've handled uh, the networking here is that you don't have to worry about the DHCP for the edge lab crossing into your Wi-Fi DHCP. They listen on different network addresses. You can actually see the machines are getting created in the background as we go. Uh, these are the leases of the machines that have come in, their MAC address. And the machines themselves are getting picking up uh, names based on those MAC addresses. It's completely overridable. Um, uh, but in this case, it's going through that process. We're waiting for that third machine to come up. Green light means I've got it here. And that, that machine uh, is uh, been discovered. Now it's going through its actual um, integration process. It sets up all the pieces, the IP address, my SSH key and, and components like that. So as an example for this, uh, we can show you. So this is still, I'm on the Pi. I can SSH to root at 10.3.14.100, one of the machines that came up. That looks great. Um, it's running Sledgehammer, which is an in-memory OS. There's no attached drives at this point. Um, or if I exit here and actually exit the Pi Zero back to my desktop, and I can SSH into the same machine now from my desktop because I've installed the key. Once again, I've done this in the past, so I have to clear my past key. That looks great. And now I'm on the same machine from my desktop. Um, so I don't always have to hop through that gateway machine if I want to because uh, I've installed my own SSH. I don't have to do it anyway, but it's very handy um, to have your SSH key installed in this case. And I don't need to stay in these machines at all. So coming back over to uh, the system, I am now in a place where I have um, digital rebar running. All three of these Pi clusters are checked in, Pixie booted, and running um, a Linux kernel. Excellent, that's good. Their gateway to the internet um, patch. I mean, everything's ready to go. I can start installing software. And that is our next stage. So.